Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Shona Martin, the CEO of the Walkley Foundation. Before I hand over to your masterclass presenter, Donna Page, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm Zooming, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and to the elders of other First Nations people around Australia, as I know today's attendees are joining us from far and wide. At the Walkley Foundation, we are committed to encouraging excellence in Australian journalism, as well as journalists' professional development. We're also committed to programs which encourage newsroom sustainability and diversity and recognise public interest journalism, like this one. I urge all of you to keep in touch with the programs and awards that you may qualify for via our Walkley Foundation social media and newsletter. Indeed, make a diary note, entries for our mid-year awards, scholarships and fellowships open on March the 7th. And of course, the Walkley Awards for 2001, which were held over by COVID, will be announced on February the 25th. Follow the night on Twitter at Walkley's and on our website. I started my journalism career in New Zealand, joining the Auckland Star, an afternoon newspaper, as a cadet reporter after a university journalism course. It was a heady time to be a journalist. The Watergate scandal, exposed by the efforts of Washington Post journalists Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein in 1972, had highlighted how two dogged reporters with good contacts and determination could take on the powerful and precipitate the resignation of US President Richard Nixon. If you don't know the story, hunt out the movie All the President's Men Online. At the Auckland Star, we may have been using manual typewriters and dictating our court stories to copy takers from public phone boxes, but fearless investigative journalism was what we aspired to. When I was a cadet, a team led by Deputy Editor Pat Booth exposed a case of wrongful conviction in the country's most celebrated double murder case by using forensic evidence that proved that police had retrospectively planted a cartridge case to frame him. As a result of these stories, the wrongfully convicted farmer, Arthur Allen Thomas, was released from prison after nine years, pardoned and paid almost $1 million in compensation. Then, four senior reporters, including the star's first female police reporter, Sue McPherson, broke a huge international drug story, coining the name Mr. Asia for a Kiwi-led syndicate that was responsible for two dead drug couriers buried in Australia, a Mr. Big found with his hands cut off in an isolated quarry in England, and a colourful bit player, a young law clerk photographed cavorting on a bed strewn with banknotes. She, she said she thought he was a property developer. As a young journalist, I listened to Gog as the reporter sitting in front of me, Josh Easby, teed up a rendezvous on top of Mangaree Mountain, one of Auckland's small volcanic cones. I'll be in a blue zephyr and I'll circle right four times, then to the left three, he said to his contact, or something similar. I can't really remember what the car was. The real world intruded when we were told that there was a $30,000 contract out to kill our inspirational deputy editor, Pat Booth, and threaten his family. The gang's warning included tampering with his wife's car and breaking into his house and turning off the deep freeze so rotting meat would send a stark warning. Thankfully, the journalists survived and the surviving syndicate leaders went to prison their crimes undone by determined and inquiring journalists in a small city of half a million people. These experiences taught me the importance of solid reporting, a sound grasp of basic skills, and an unwavering determination to break stories and reveal the truth. Not to mention the dangers and the need for hard work and quiet bravery. It showed me the advantages of learning from more experienced journalists. If journalism is the career for you, you've come to the right place today. This masterclass will, without doubt, prove invaluable. 
Today's session, of course, is called Investigative Journalism in Rural Communities. Where do you find stories to investigate and how do you get started? Walkley winning investigative journalist Donna Page will outline some of the data, documents and records available to sift through and how to work efficiently with your newsroom's resources, no matter how limited. When, when you live in the community you're investiga investigating, you have skin in the game and so do your sources. What are the ethical considerations and what security measures might you need to consider? Donna Page is, of course, an investigative reporter for the Newcastle Herald, where she previously worked as chief of staff and day editor. She ran a mentoring program at the Newcastle Herald for several years and regularly works on investigations with other staff as part of the paper's training program. She's also worked for the South China Morning Post and the Portuguese news agency, Lusa, covering news and business. She spent several years as an investigative reporter for the Chinese English current affairs magazine, Macau Closer. Passionate about regional journalism, Page won Walkley Awards for coverage of community and regional affairs in 2016, 2019 and 2020, and was a finalist in 2013. She was also part of a Newcastle Herald team that won a United Nations Association of Australia Award for environmental reporting in 2015. Donna's, as you know, um, Walkley's included the you right to, Your Right to Know campaign in 2020 and Dirty Deeds in 2019, which was about toxic waste dumping in the region. And there's an added bonus, you're also going to hear from a special guest. Andrew Messenger is a journalist at the Northern Daily Leader in Tamworth and will share some insights from his recent reporting in the community, which has been nominated for a Walkley Award. Good luck in a couple of weeks, Andrew. I'll now hand over to Donna and Andrew. Thanks to them once again and enjoy. Thanks, Shane. I really appreciate the introduction there. Um, so um, basically, um, we're going to run this today by, um, I'm going to probably talk um, for probably about 40 minutes or so. And then um, uh, Andrew's going to come on and he's going to tell you about the investigation that has seen him nominated uh, for a Walkley um, this year. And, um, and then we'll both um, hang around for as long as need be at the end. Well, at least I will. Um, and I think Andrew, Andrew's um, going to do that as well and answer any questions or um, you know, have a chat um, about anything that um, anybody might like to ask. So um, I suppose I should probably kick off. I'm, I've, I've got a PowerPoint presentation, which I'll run through. Just give me a second. Um, yes, and Andrew's saying he'll definitely hang around for a chat. So, um, and uh, I'll just give me a second and I'll share my screen with you. And I have to say that um, showing my age, I'm not the greatest on tech. So if there's any issues here, um, I, won't, I won't be a minute. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so I, I suppose we'd like to also thank um, the Walkley Foundation um, for making sure that that's going to work for me. Um, <clears throat> so if I can no longer see the chat box. Give me a second here. Just give me a second, guys. I've just got to... Yeah, okay, that's better. I did warn you that I'm not the greatest with tech. Okay, that's much better. Um, okay. Still actually can't see the chat box. So I'm just going to, I'm going to proceed with what we've got here. Um, and look, if anybody's raising their hand in the chat box, I might get Andrew to, um, to, to jump in and let me know. Um, okay, so, oh, hang on, I've got the chat box up, we're good. Awesome, okay, I'm good to go. Like I said, not the greatest with tech. All right, okay, so um, 
Yeah, so thanks to Shona for the introduction. So my name is Donna Page and I work as a journalist at the Newcastle Herald for three years, um, uh, three days a week, sorry. And I've, been, <laughs> I've worked there for many years, kind of coming and going over the, the duration of my career. Um, and I also teach journalism at the Newcastle University as well. Um, so firstly, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, the land that I'm zooming to you from, the traditional land of the Awabakal people. Um, I recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and continuing relationship with this land. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about um, investigative journalism in rural and regional communities. Um, and so I'll run through the presentation and what I've tried to, to do today is um, put as much information in here as I can, so it's kind of like a bit of a take home thing uh, for you, happy to share the presentation with anyone uh, via email afterwards, my email um, details will be at the end. Um, so. Um, I suppose one of the biggest things, and I have no doubt that, you know, we're all going to be on the same page here, is that um, in rural and regional newsrooms, um, it's super, super challenging um, in terms of time, staff and resources, um, especially with the downward trend um, in the size of our newsrooms over, over you know, many years now, unfortunately. Um, and so I it's, it's definitely hard and I acknowledge that it's really difficult at times to get away from the daily grind. Um, but I think that we have to make opportunities to do that as best we can uh, within the constraints that we have. And I think, and I always say this to my students um, as well, that picking the low hanging fruit in terms of journalism, it's okay sometimes, but it doesn't always serve our communities and it certainly doesn't always serve us as journalists. So I think we need to be looking at what more we can do in terms of what, what, what we can look at in terms of public service journalism, in terms of looking below the surface, um, and in terms of holding power to account, which is obviously super important for us. And so while we don't always have as much time as what we might need um, and what we might want, um, I think that if we can try to get ourselves into developing an investigative mindset, even just when you're on your normal beat reporting or you're doing your normal day-to-day -day job, if you can start looking, you know, for investigative follow-ups um, in general stories, um, a lot of times they're there. Um, and the thing that you need to really think about is um, what you could do that nobody else is doing at the moment. Um, and in rural and regional communities, our um, you know, our currency is localism. So we have to be looking at trying to do stories that are going to better our communities, basically. Um, and so the one thing that I know for sure um, is that um, uh, doing investigations, especially in newsrooms that don't have a lot of resources, and I fully acknowledge that the Newcastle Herald probably has uh, quite a fair amount of resources compared to some of the newsrooms where you guys work, um, but uh, planning, uh, while it's really important in any kind of investigative work, it's super crucial um, if, if, if you're also pushed for time and resources and also, you know, supporting staff around you. Um, and so the other thing that I think that is a really important thing to do is so start looking for ideas, keep an ideas file on things that might come up. You might be able to get to them straight away, but things that you think might make a good investigation. Um, so start to just have that watchdog, you know, mindset, I suppose. Um, and also you need to brainstorm your ideas and, you know, uh, sol solutions to, 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 to problems and things along those lines with people around you, uh, if it's possible. Um, you know, find yourself a mentor, uh, either in your newsroom or in another newsroom or somebody that you might know that they might be able to just give you some tips and advice on how to get over um, you know, problems, your editor um, is, is a great starting point. Um, and so once you've kind of come up with an idea, you need to identify a central theme within that idea. And I would say that you've also got to identify supporting themes and, and, and really think about how you use them in conjunction with each other. Um, because investigations, they tend to, they might start as a one germ of an idea and then they can tend to you know they, they they can grow and they can they can turn into much bigger than than what you originally thought um and so the other thing that is 
I think good journalism, it's the same, it looks the same, um, basically anywhere we, where you are, whether you're in, um, you know, a, a rural or regional newsroom or in a metro newsroom, good journalism has to be relatable. Um, and, and, and people are the things that make stories. And so I think that you need to really, um, you know, focus on uh, on making contacts and 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 meeting people in your community um and so once you've come up with an idea especially and when i'll go back to that theme of, of being pushed for time and resources um you know make a pitch um and take it to your boss and the one thing i'm going to say to you here is never over promise because what I'll do is basically you'll lose credibility. If you go in there and say, you know, I've got this amazing idea and it's going to result in this, you'd better to go in there and under promise and over deliver. And then your editor's going to think that you're absolutely amazing because you've come up with, you know, a much better story than what he thought you were even going to, to, to get. Um, so in terms of your pitch, you need to talk about how the work's going to impact your community, how it's going to help your news organisation set the news agenda, um, and, and how basically it's, it's, it's going to make you um, stand out from other news organisations and, 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 and just go that extra level, which I think, you know, as journalists, you know, we, we all want to get into great stories. We all want to break great yarns. We all want to do things that are really important for our community. And that, you know, that, that's what journalism's about. Um, and so then the tricky part, and, and, you know, this comes down to your boss, your editor, whoever, you, whoever you're, um, you're uh, reporting to, you need to negotiate for time and space to be able to do the, the investigation that you want to do. Um, and so once it, once you've managed to negotiate that and um, you can start small, um, you know, like even one hour in your day and some people will say, I don't have an hour in my day, I'm so busy. And that's okay, maybe one hour a week. We can all carve out one hour a week where you can work on that project and you can just make some in incremental gains. And then as you start to make more gains, you go back to your boss and say, hey, this is where I am. I need some more time to be able to get this across the line. Um, and the other thing I'm going to say is once you've got your editor's support to be able to do something or your boss's support or you've decided that you're going to just do something, um, be really clear about how, how you're spending your time. Don't take off from the office for three hours to go and do a bunch of interviews without letting someone know. Let them know that you're working on that project so they're not thinking, oh, gosh, X, Y, Z is just off bludging and not doing anything. Um, so like I said, you know, you want to keep your boss informed. Um, and stories change all the time, uh, especially investigations. Um, some of them, like I said, they'll turn out to be a lot uh, more interesting and more valuable than what you thought at the start. And some of them, they just turn out to be not as good as what you thought. And I think the thing is that if you think you're onto something and then you realise you're not, be honest about it. Go straight to the editor and said, "Look, you know, this isn't. This doesn't have as much juice as what I thought it did. Uh, it's not working out the way that I would have hoped. Um, I can still get a story, or I can't get a story. Um, but generally, you should still be able to get something out of it." Um, uh, and another tip that I'm going to give you is that a lot of the investigative work. Um, and so I've been doing investigative work um, at the Newcastle Herald for about 10 years. I still write general news. Uh, so I'm, I'm writing a story today about a steam locomotive. Um, and so uh, basically it, it generates a lot of documents. Um, and so when you get documents um, and, and documents can really put you on firm ground, they can be your best friend. Um, but the thing that I'll, I would say is that you need to know what's in, you know, like I end up sometimes with some investigations with bags and volumes of documents. Um, and so when you're reading through them, you really need to mark them up properly um, and, you know, know what in, is in each document. And as you're reading them, you know, mark material that you know you'll need for writing because ultimately if you don't do that, you're going to have to read it again. But if you've, if you've put a post-it note on it, and said, you know, with exclamation marks and kind of written exactly what's on there, uh, you'll be super grateful when you go to write because it'll be really obvious where you need to go to get those things. Think about pictures, graphics, videos, maps, all of those kinds of things, if they're possible, online content. Um, if the project's getting too big um, and if you're really struggling to manage with it, 
Is there somebody else that you could draw in to help you? If not, try to break it up into manageable chunks so that you can keep your momentum and you don't get lost. Um, you know, a lot of investigations, they're not one story, um, especially in regional and rural communities, because, because we, are, we have the advantage of being on the ground um, and we have the advantage of being immersed in our community. And so one of the, and I'll come to this, but one of the really um, big advantages that we have is we can write follow-up story after follow-up story after follow-up story and follow-up stories are great. Um, so, you know, you might wanna look, look at um, breaking it up um, just so you can keep your momentum. Don't get stuck with this um, huge, big, um, you know, thing and you're thinking, I just don't even know where to go with this. Plan, um, come up with a plan, know exactly what you're doing. At the, end of, at the end of each, you know, if it's a few days you're doing this or it might be a few weeks or it could even be a few months, write yourself a little memo, like, you know, every now and again and just where you're at and just so you make sure that you keep your focus. Where are we going with this? And the one thing that I know in terms of your newsroom is one successful investigation will help you make a much better case for getting time for another. So if you can crack a great yarn or you can crack a good yarn that you know your boss is super impressed with, you go back in there with another idea, of course he or she is gonna go, yeah, I wanna, I wanna be able to make the time for you to be able to do this. Um, so you really need within your own newsroom, and I'm not talking about in your community, that's a whole nother thing, but within your own newsroom, develop a reputation for being that person that will deliver. Um, because it's super important because, it, 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 you know, you've got the credibility, you've got the runs on the board. And yes, you know, of course, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll shift things, they'll move things so you can, can get that valuable extra little bit of time so you can work on something outside of what might be, your, you know, your, your daily round. Um, and so I think, so some, some good starting points. Um, and look, I mean, uh, to me, stories, as I've already said, stories are about people. And so you need to listen to people around you, complaints, concerns, they can turn into great stories, really long and complicated story. And I don't have the time for it, but I was talking to a truck driver at my local pub and he was telling me there was a guy who had been missing for a few months and he was telling me this story about how he knew that um, he was involved in dealing drugs at a local tip because the guy worked at a tip and he was a truck driver that went in and out and he'd witnessed it. And anyway, so he's telling me this big story. So I rang the police and I said, are you guys aware of this? No, they weren't aware of it. Um, we, that, they then set up a bunch of wiretaps. We came out with the story. It ended up that the guy had been murdered over a drug deal that had gone wrong and, and, and they were able to solve the murder um, and able to, to um, inform his family. And he'd been missing for quite some time about what happened to him. And that was just through a conversation that I had with a truck driver at a pub. Um, so you have to listen and really genuinely listen and take those opportunities to, to, to talk to people in your local community. Um, get out of the office. I know you, can't always do it and, and, and I fully accept that and that, that that a lot of people are super busy throughout the day and they can feel like they're chained to their desk but where possible try to get yourself out talk to people rather than go to all of the council meetings if they're if they're webcast try don't sit in the office and, and watch all of them by the webcast make sure that you get to some if there's a community gathering or a conference on go go down to the sale yards have a yarn you know collect business cards set up meetings and you know follow up with phone calls because developing contacts um that's where stories come from and the other thing is too and, and i was having this um conversation with some other journalists on a panel last week um during the 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 summit and we were talking about how you know, there's a story in everything um, and, and, they, and there's stories everywhere and you just have to be alert and be on the lookout all the time because, because they're there. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, the key and, 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 and uh, you know, the key to comprehensive, authentic storytelling is building relationships of trust with people and there's no doubt in that. Um, the other thing that I would say, you know, as someone, you know, that's been doing investigative work for a while, some people tend to want to hold things really close to their chest and not tell people what they know. But what I have found from experience that, you know, if you've got a contact and you're trying to get something out of them, if you share with them what you know, 
then there's a pretty good chance that maybe it might help them open up a little bit as well. It's a genuine exchange of information here. Um, the other thing is to, you know, that there's so many resources that are under our nose that we don't realise that they are, that they are there. Um, you know, a lot of stories of, of similar stories or stories of that type have probably been done by somebody else. Have a look, check them out, see how they've dealt with them. Um, be really diligent in keeping your contacts list. I, I um, you know, as a younger journalist was terrible at it. Um, I was always running around the newsroom asking someone for a phone number. Um, but contact lists are obviously, they're invaluable. So anytime that you meet someone, write their details down because one day you're going to want to find a nurse that works at that particular, you know, clinic or something along those lines and you will have met her three years ago. Um, and the other thing, especially, and this is especially important for beat reporters or people that are covering around, you really need to learn how systems work. And so if you're a council reporter, you need to understand how their systems work because in so many cases, you know, investigations can evolve from, um, you know, people um, not following the processes or the process is not working. And so if you understand how they work, then you can identify when they're not being followed or when they're not working. Um, I say this to my journalism students at university all the time, target areas that you're knowledgeable about. There's nothing wrong. If you've got experience in something or you've got some inside knowledge about something, um, as long as it's not a massive conflict of interest and you can run that by, by your boss, um, target that area because, because, because you've, got, you've got an advantage over others. If you know something, have a look into it. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of investigative journalism comes down to you know, trawling through documents and data and all of that kind of thing. And as I said, really powerful information can be sitting, you know, in plain sight. And I'll give you an example. The dirty deeds investigation that the Newcastle Herald did that my colleague and I, Nick Bilby, we won a Walkley for. Um, we, we had filed, it was about toxic waste dumping by um, a waste oil refinery over decades into creeks. Um, there's there's several creeks that are off limits that you know the water can't be used now, and they were they were dumping at night time during rain. Um, so nobody you know so it was flushed and no, no, nobody knew. But we we found out and you know we ended up interviewing all of these workers and that kind of thing. And then we started trawling through the EPA's website and we found all these compliance audits and things along those lines. And it was all on their website and there was gold information in there. And so you know we we built up this story and then we actually looked right in front of us and and there was all this other information that could take that story to to, to another level. So so look. Look, look at what's in front of you. Um, and for, for, for us as journalists, you know, living um, in, in the regional and rural communities uh, where we work, um, you, you need to be looking at original reporting on issues that are important to your community. Um, and, I, and I can't stress that enough um, because, you know, journalism can make real change in, in communities. Um, uh, so in, in my experience, and, and um, you can probably tell by my age, um, I am a huge fan of traditional shoe leather reporting. Um, I, I think that with many investigative stories, um, there's no shortcuts. Um, you, you know, you've got to get on the ground and, um, you know, you can mine social media accounts and you can mine records and you can do all of those things. But from my experience in a lot of stories, and maybe not all, obviously not all, but going door to door, um, being persistent and also being patient, and those two things can kind of work against each other at times. Um, but, uh, you know, it allows you to build relationships with people that are involved. And with the Dirty Deeds investigation, Nick and I ended up talking to more than 40 uh, former and, and employees that had worked at that plant. And, and you know, they were all, just nearly not all of them, but most of them were singing the same story. Um, and in those cases, they, a lot of those guys had done, done, done the wrong thing. They, they'd been involved um, in the pollution. And so they were, um, you know, they were really nervous about talking to us. And so I think that in situations like that or in situations where you're talking to people, they, you, it's always really important, and I can't stress this enough, um, to be transparent and honest about what you're doing. Um, 
you know, at times people can be motivated because they might want to clarify something that you, that they think is wrong or there's been a misconception. Um, and I always say as well that you, you never try to push people into doing things. Um, you know, it, it doesn't work. Um, you end up not having, uh, you know, the, the relationship between you and them. It's, it, 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 it's, it's just not, it's just, it's just not the right thing to do. And I think that if you can be genuine with people and that they can then, I suppose, you know, have a level of, of being more comfortable, um, you're listening to them, they feel heard, um, that someone's actually listening to what they've got to say. At times, that can be enough of a motivation for them to think, oh, you know, question, well, maybe they should be involved, maybe they should say something. Um, the other thing that I always say is that, you know, that when you make, when you meet these people and, you know, they become your contacts, your sources, wherever that, wherever they're from, and they may not be from going door to door, it might be someone in a hospital, someone in a school. Um, if you're writing a story and, and it involves them and you're talking to them, I always like to keep them updated with the progress of how things are going. So you might want to tell them everything um, and, and, and you probably wouldn't. But or maybe maybe you would in some instances. But what that does is it's a genuine. It's it's like the people when you're going door to door. It's a genuine exchange of information, and it also it, it helps build trust. And they're telling you things. You're telling them things. You're trusting each other. Um, and it also it gives you another opportunity to talk to that person. And in a lot of cases, they'll go, oh, you know, there was this thing that I forgot to tell you. And then they'll tell you something else. And it might end up being, you know, a really key part. So keep those lines of communication open. And the other thing is too, the, the person will really appreciate it. You know, when's the story coming out? What are we, you know, like how, what are we kind of doing with it? How's it gonna look? All of those things, they're not hard questions to answer. Um, and as I said before, you know, as local news teams, um, we have a massive advantage over our, um, you know, major city counterparts in terms of we're on the ground, we can write follow-up story after follow-up story after follow-up story. And, and this, I can't stress this enough, if you're doing an investigation and there are opportunities for follow-up stories, you need to be relentless about that. Be dogged, just keep writing them. Um, you know, I remember uh, Carrie Fellner, who used to work at the Newcastle Herald, and she now works as an investigative reporter at the Sydney Morning Herald. And she was doing um, some stories about um, uh, PFAS pollution and a community near here in the Hunter region. And she said to me, she don't, she, she'd only just recently joined the newsroom, and she said to me, oh, you know, I feel kind of awkward you know people thinking god will she ever shut up about william town the other journalists people in the community you know and i just said to her these are the stories that matter keep writing them because we're, we're representing our communities and so don't don't give up because you wouldn't yeah but anyway be dogged be relentless um combining data this is um i think combining quality research into human interest stories um it helps improve the storytelling there's no doubting about that um, and it also ensures that the reporting's in the public interest. Um, and when you're doing an investigation or something along those lines, if there's businesses or industry or, or that kind of thing involved, consider, you know, who's in charge, consider what laws govern it, consider what regulations, because that might help you, you know, spin off into a new area that you can, that you can look at. Um, as I said before, documents and data can, can really help and, you know, um, they can provide mountains of information um, and whether you get them through FOI, which is the next point, or whether you get them, you know, uh, that they're leaked to you or whether you just get them from websites or whether you, you know, you manage to trawl through some data and put something together yourself. Um, it's great to have that as a backup, they can really put you on firm ground. Um, so when you're doing an investigation and thinking to yourself, um, why isn't there more accountability and why isn't there more transparency? What's happened here? Lodge some freedom of information requests. And so I'm going to, I won't go into that too much now because a little bit further down the track, I'm going to talk about a case study, um, that involved freedom of information requests. But if you haven't lodged one, you know, or a GIPA request in New South Wales, they cost 
thirty dollars generally, um, and 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 they're very worth doing. Um, and if you get um, <laughs> negative responses to them. And increasingly, I think journalists get negative responses to their GIPA and FOI requests. Um, appeal, appeal, appeal again, um, and, uh, and lodge more requests. I just recently had a an incident where I was trying to find out how much Newcastle City Council had spent on, on um, moving into some new headquarters. And initially when they got the councillors to agree to move, they said that they were gonna spend $7 million. I'd heard that they'd spent nearly $18 million. And so I lodged a bunch of gippers, blocked, 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 blocked. And I just kept going. It took me nearly two years. But in the end, I found out that they'd spent $17.6 million. So it was worth all of those appeals. Um, and I'll get to it a little bit later, but appeals to someone like the Information and Privacy Commission here in New South Wales, they don't cost you anything, just your time to write a submission asking for one. Um, so, Experts, they're everywhere, um, you know, universities, NGOs, um, advocacy groups, community groups, you know, that they, they can be really helpful to add extra layers. Also, you know, if you're a little bit unsure on something, um, ask them, get, seek their opinion. They might be able to help you if, if it's if 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 it's if it's something that you're a little bit unsure about. I've done that a lot, you know, rung up an expert at the university and said, look, I've got this report. Can you help me? Can you help me read it? I, I came across a forensic accountant in a story that I did once. And now when I'm looking at really complicated financials, I always ring him and say, am I right about this? Yes, you are. And, and it takes five minutes. So keep those people um, because they're really useful. Um, and don't be don't, don't be shy to ask. I mean, most people are more than happy to help because um, most people support public interest journalism. And if they don't, they've generally got something to hide. Um, and so I think that the type of, you know, reporting that we can do in our communities, long term advocacy reporting for, on, on topics, uh, they, they can really affect change. And, and so you kind of have to be like a, a loudspeaker and not give up and just keep um, you know, going. If you, if you know that the important is that issue, don't give up. Um, so there's a whole range of things that you can do. You, know, you might get a tip about something and you know, how do you turn that into an investigation? Um, so as I said, you know, documents, you know, sometimes they can be the end of your search and sometimes they're the beginning. Uh, and a lot of times they'll lead you to more people and, 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 and more people um, that know about whatever you're looking at is exactly where you want to go. Um, if you can't get everything in the story, and this has happened to me so many times, I, I was writing a story about some mine subsidence that had, there's a mine that had undermined a conservation area and I'd been told by a bushwalker that there was some pretty horrific mine subsidence in this conservation area, but you needed ropes and the, 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 the terrain was pretty full on. So one of our photographers, um, he, he was like, oh, you know, I'll go in there. So he, he, he sent me a message through the day and he said to me, um, you know, this is worse than you thought. Um, and he started sending me pictures and, and, and I didn't go with him um, because he said, I'll be way quicker without you, you know, like, and we can go back in together later. Yeah, no worries. And I'd been told when underground mines go through, a lot of times they grout behind them um, and sits to, to fill voids and things. And I'd been told that there was a rumour that the mine had accidentally grouted a creek, so cemented a creek, basically. Anyway, we couldn't find the grouted creek, but we had all these great and they weren't great. They were horrible pictures of cliffs, rocks sheared off, ground just upended. Um, anyway, we, we ran the story. And so the next day I get this anonymous phone call from this guy and he says to me, oh, you missed the grouted creek. And I said, yeah, we did. We couldn't find it. And he gave me the, the, the instructions of where it was. And, and Darren, Payton being Darren, um, the photographer, he'd had a GPS with him when he went in. So he knew exactly where he had to go back to track in to find, to find the creek. And so we found this creek and they had seriously concreted a creek. And so what came of that was that the mine, um, they had to send men in there with picks to dig it up because you couldn't get machinery in because it was a conservation area and they had to use bags with helicopters to take the, the concrete out. Um, so at times, even if you don't have the whole story, if you've hit a brick wall, run the story anyway because it, it, it could bring out a whistleblower and it could force more information from, you know, like a government uh, or uh, organisation or an institution. Follow up, follow up, follow up. Can't stress it enough. Get the local pollies on board. 
uh, they can be great for information. You know, they get a lot of uh, letters and things from their constituents. Um, so keep them on board. But if you need to look at them, look at them. Um, be dogged, be relentless. Um, it definitely gets attention. And the more dogged and relentless you are, you get, you get, you get, you get eventually, you know, whatever capital city, Sydney, they'll, they, you know, they'll, they'll start, the politicians in Sydney will, will, will start to get word of this and they'll start to look at it. Um, you know, if you're looking at something that's really complicated, break down issues, analyse it, you know, uh, investigative journalism, you know, it needs to help inform or start community uh, debate or political debate. Um, if space is a problem, like I said, break it up into a series. And I think that we have this really important role in regional and rural communities that they probably don't have so much in metro areas. Um, where we can we can really get involved in advocacy reporting. And uh, another example that I can think of, I went to a, uh, there's a, a small community here, I actually live in this community, it's a small peninsula community across the harbour from Newcastle. It's a population of about 4,000 people and it, it's, it has a beach and the beach is severely impacted by erosion because of the Newcastle Harbour break walls. It stops the, the, the drift sand coming to the beach. And so, the erosion is threatening houses, businesses. It's, you know, it's, it's a pretty dire environmental state. And so I went to a public meeting and a guy from the Office of Environment and Heritage, he stood up and he said, oh, I remember being at a community meeting here 30 years ago talking about the exact same issue, nothing's changed. And I used that quote. And then I went back to the editor, my editor, Heath Harrison, and, I, and I, 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 we talked about it. And he said to me, you know, we, 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 we need to get on this. You know, this community has been fighting to have this problem looked at, because, but because they're so small and because they have such a, you know, like a, a tiny voice, you know, we need, to, we need to get on it. And so we did, and we started a, a community campaign called Save Our um, Stockton, and that's the name of the suburb. Um, and so, you know, uh, community members put up banners all through the suburb. We ended up getting two ministers up here. Uh, the government... Uh, provided money to um, look at overturning the laws against um, offshore marine dredging to re-nourish the beach and that is ongoing work um, and so this community that had been fighting for decades to try to get something done about the beach which is an important asset for you know the whole of the region where I live and broader the environment um, they'd gotten nowhere and suddenly you know within 12 to 18 months you know, we had this loud hailer on this on this issue. It made national news, um, and 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 slowly but surely, and we haven't given up, and we're still we're still, um, you know, chipping away at it. But they're looking at, at whether they can amend the legislation so that they can re-nourish this beach with offshore sand because the the beach has lost too much sand to be able to get the sand from anywhere else. Um, investigations don't always have to be lengthy, um, and. You know, the one thing that if if you crack one investigation, um, and, and I know that this is for sure, and I've said say this a few times throughout, you'll get yourself a reputation for people with people in the community even as someone that they can come to, someone that they can trust to have a look at whatever problem that they're having. And that's what you want. Um, so I've got a list of documents and databases and records here. Now I'm not going to run through them all. Um, but GIPPERS and FOI is really, really important. One that I'm going to highlight, just in case um, you, there's, there are people <clears throat> in the class today that aren't aware of this. So all government departments have to open to um, uh, FOI requests. And so they also keep a disclosure log. And so for anybody that doesn't know what that is, a disclosure log is something where they have to keep a list of all of the FOIs that they've received. Um, and it details what the person's asked for. It doesn't say who, the, who they were that has asked. Lots of them are journalists. Um, and whether they've given the information. Now, if something goes on a disclosure log, there's great ideas in there. You know, there's, a, there's, there's so many other journalists around the country that have, uh, that have put in FOIs. <clears throat> See if you can have a look through those disclosure logs and, and, and replicate something for your community. Uh, the other thing is too, if there's information on the disclosure log that might be relevant to you, Call the department up, tell them you want it, and they have to give it to you for free. So super handy to know that. Um, there's a whole range of other things there. I've tried to put in a fair bit of information, so I won't go through them all. Happy to talk about any of them later. Republish what you can if you can't uh, advance it. 
how do you mitigate risk of defamation without knowing further facts? Oh, okay, Al, it's a good question. Um, so I would never um, publish something that I wasn't that that I was concerned and about in terms of legal ramifications. So if you're concerned about something, so what I mean by publish what you can if you can't get it across the line. If you if you know it's like the, the creek. I I had very strong suspicions because I'd been told by a source that there was a grounded creek. I couldn't find it, couldn't get any information on it. But I published what I knew had happened in that area. And then somebody else came forward. So if you know that there has been an assault in a school, right, just just as an example, and uh, you have you're talking to the parent of the child that's been assaulted, and um, that parent has told you that the child was hit by a teacher, and that the teacher has this terrible record of you know um, of, of um, you know abusing or hitting children or something that has been covered up. Now you mightn't be able to get that terrible record of the teacher, you may not know if it's true, leave it out. Uh, run the story about the child being hit, you've got to go to the school, you've got to get all sides of the story, you've got to go to the teacher, you've got to go to the education department. So run the story. And then there's a chance that someone might have come across that teacher somewhere else or someone knows that teacher and they might ring you up and say, hey, that guy was involved in this big scandal at this other school, you should check it out. That's the kind of thing I mean. So never run something if if you're not certain of the facts, but you, you leave the bit that you don't understand that you, you don't know out and see if your suspicions can be confirmed by putting some of the story out there. That's what I mean. I hope that helps. Um, okay, so then there's some more documents and databases. The other thing I'm just going to say here as well, uh, ASIC are uh, amazing for um, you know filings and things like that for businesses that have gone bankrupt, that kind of thing. Um, you know, you can jump on there, your company searches, all of, the, all of those documents are on there. Just familiarise yourself with the search engine, takes a little while. Liquidator reports, administrator reports. So um, you can buy liquidator reports off, off ASIC and, and, they're, and they're awesome. There's, there can be so much detail in those. But one thing that I'll say to you is with limited resources and limited funds, if you find out who the liquidator is, ring the liquidator and say, hey, I work for this regional newspaper, rural newspaper, we don't have a lot of money, would you be able to send me a copy of your report? Or the other thing that you can do is um, find a creditor and ask them to send you a copy of the report because they get them. Another thing that you want to do if you're following up a company or a business, and, and, and I've written a lot of stories like this, you can set alerts in the ASIC system. If there's any changes in that company or business, so if they file any documents with ASIC, it'll send you an alert saying, hey, you know, the Newcastle Jets just filed a new document, and so I'll jump on board and see what it is. Um, so that can be really handy and you don't even have to keep looking, it lets you know. Uh, court records. So case law um, in New South Wales, um, it publishes so many court judgments, um, you know, every day and it's onerous to be able to have a look at them. But one thing that you can do, and it'll take you 10 minutes, is to jump on some of these, say, for example, if you're in New South Wales, jump on case law. Um, They've got a great um, search engine system, and I'm sure all of the other states in the terms of their court systems do as well. Um, and type in your town's name. So I, I go on there all the time, Newcastle. And, and, it, and, and whatever has, if there's any reference to Newcastle, it'll pop up. Um, you know, think of other uh, uh, words that might, you know, like uh, for us here in the Hunter Valley, I'll look at mining or, you know, something along those lines. So, so a quick 10 minute look in the morning and you might find yourself you know, a story, and this is an example of one that happened, um, a story about uh, an eye surgeon, you know, that had sent 10 patients blind. Um, and he was up again, he was up on all of these um, issues in terms of um, complaints and things along those lines. Amazing story. And there it is just by typing in Newcastle. Um, so those kinds of things. Uh, universities, uh, you know, if, if you've got one nearby, uh, they're a wealth of information. Broad areas that you can explore. Um, and once again, I'm not going to go through them all because this is really, I put these here so you guys can have a look at them. If you can't think of things that you might want to do an investigation on, then, you know, ha have a look at some of these things. You might be able to think, yeah, I could do that. Um, you know, but long running community issues that are not being addressed, like the beach that I was talking to you about. Those are the kinds of things, talk to your editor, can we get on this? You know, by, by, by lending our voice to this tiny community, they've made massive inroads. Um, 
And, you know, there's a whole range of different things, health stories, you know, um, there's uh, taxpayer waste. Um, you know, you might get a tip about something. Um, you may, and even if you just want to start looking at things yourself, you know, um, crime stats, another, another um, you know, big one. Um, here in New South Wales, we have um, uh, Boxar for our crime stats. Their website's amazing. Um, you know, and if you, if, if, you, if you can't negotiate the website, then, um, you know, they've got data people that you can ring up and they'll help you. It's the same as the ABS and the, and the census. Never be afraid to ask. Um, generally, people are, are more than willing to help. Um, what else is there? There's so many different ideas and things. And, and like I said, I'm not a huge user of social media. I have to be honest about that. Most of my um, stories um, and reporting are sparked by talking to people, getting a tip, that kind of thing. Um, but I have a lot of, I, I know a lot of other journalists that use social media. I, I use it to check things or maybe to get in contact with someone. But I know, um, you know, a lot of journalists that, that mine social media and they come up with great stories. And social media can be really good for trends and things along those lines. Um, you know, there's another thing, um, you know, th there's, I'll give you an example. There's a, a company called CoreLogic. Uh, they have a PR person. She's amazing. Um, you know, you might want to know how many properties have sold, and this is just an example at the top of my head, uh, for over a million dollars in the region where you live in the last five years. And if you ring her up, um, send her an email, they will mine their data for you and give it to you for free. All you've got to do is ask. Um, and so, you know, you really, you, you just need to be on the front foot and thinking of ideas and then thinking, how can I get this information? Postcode wage data, another great one. Um, financial counsellors, um, you know, uh, most areas have financial counsellors. They deal with people that get themselves into financial strife with credit cards or bills or things along those lines. They are awesome for stories. Like, you know, if you're writing something about, you know, um, families being cash strapped and all those kinds of things. They keep data on how many people they see, the trends that they see, all those kinds of things. There's a, there's, there's a range of different things and there's obviously not exhaustive, but just some, some things. Um, and the one thing I think in terms of investigative journalism, I'm gonna to try to hurry up here a little, is that you need to strive to be a champion for your community. That's what it's all about. Um, look for resolutions, solutions and positive outcomes. Um, you know, maybe you might be able to conduct your own testing if you're told that there's some water problems or something along those lines. You know, find a lab, it doesn't cost that much, get your editor on board or team up with a university or an expert. We've done that at the Newcastle Herald. We wanted to do a heap of soil testing. We found an, an expert in that area. We went to him and we said, you know, we really want to do this soil testing. And he said, look, I've got a machine that'll do it. I'm happy to do it. We'll do it in, in collaboration. And the university was Macquarie University in Sydney. It had nothing to do with Newcastle, but, the, the, you know, the testing we were doing was here. Um, don't shy away from difficult topics. Seek help if you need it. Ask experts, academics, professional associations. Be relentless. Be dogged. Be um, dogged. Make sure promises are kept. That's another thing. If you have a win on a story and they say, yeah, we're going to do X, Y, Z, make sure you go back and check because that could spark a whole new round of stories when they haven't actually done it. Um, and raise any legal concerns you have with your boss or your editor and make sure that you flag concerns that you might have and get your stories checked. Get your stories checked by someone who is more senior if that is at all possible. Um, Another issue that we have is dealing with people that we know. Um, and I wanna make sure that I leave enough time for Andrew. So I'm just gonna quickly go through this, but I think that the best thing that I can say, and I live in a, in a community of 4,000 people. And so I know a lot of people that live in this community and everywhere you know, I walk down the street and you know, people come up and they might wanna have a chat to me about something. But I think that the best thing that you can do, and I know it can be challenging, but I always look at it as an advantage um, because you see those people in the street they're not, they're not, it's not a work environment. You can have a chat with them. You know, they, they, their guard might be down a little bit. And chance meetings have led to so many great stories for me. And I think the thing is, if you're accountable for your story and if you would say what you're writing to someone's face, you've been fair, you've been balanced, you're humble when you make mistakes and you correct them and you acknowledge it straight away, then I think that you can build yourself a reputation as someone who's fair and someone who's honest. And so even though they may not like the story, you can still call them the next day because you've been fair and you've been honest. And the other thing is that I always say is that I think that it's really important to be upfront with people about what you're doing. 
So if you're writing a story that you know is going to be controversial and involves someone, you should be going to them anyway, but you need to give them a broad synopsis of what you're doing. Don't, don't let them pick up the paper the next day and be completely surprised by the angle you've taken. That is not fair and that will get you a reputation as somebody who, you know, is being uh, using trickery or being underhanded and, and you know, you, you're going you're gonna to struggle with people when you meet them in the street if that's the kind of thing that you're going to do. And you don't want to build a reputation for doing that kind of thing. So people might not like this story. But if you've been fair, you've been balanced, you've given them a heads up and you've given them a say, that's the best you can do. And I think most people understand that. You have to have thick skin as a journalist. We expect our, 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 the people that we're writing stories about to have thick skins. We need to have thick skins. I think if someone wants to give you a spray, um, if it's within reason, listen, let them get it off their chest. Um, and it can lead to better understanding and more chance to talk about issues. Certainly have copped a lot of sprays over the years. Um, sometimes you have to agree to disagree. Always stay professional. Um, if an, if an uh, investigation that you're doing is impacting advertising, talk to your boss, leave that with them if you can. Um, and keep your editor informed about any safety concerns. I had one recently where editor had to, I was threatened by this guy who had gone to jail for attempted murder. Um, and um, my editor, you know, rang the police straight away. They took it really seriously. It was all fine, but just in case. Um, this is a case study of, and I'm, I'm going to talk for another five minutes and then hand over to Andrew. Sorry, Andrew. Um, of an investigation that the Newcastle Herald did, um, and it was called Your Right to Know. And at the time, we piggybacked on um, uh, a national campaign uh, that was looking at government and institutional secrecy. Um, and that's not unique to any community. It's happening everywhere. I'm sure you're all well aware of that. Um, you know, a culture of restrictions on journalists' ability to hold power to account, basically. And so we thought, what can we do? And so we went to our journalists in the newsroom um, and we said to everybody, what's something in your area where you think we should be able to get information and we want to know that we don't know? And the types of things that we asked are on the slide here. Um, you know, some of them were pretty basic, you know, um, one, one that I asked was what are the longest ambulance wait times and paramedic staffing levels? Um, anyway, so, so these things you think the community has a right to know these things. Uh, so we, And we looked at that national campaign and thought, what can we do locally? And anyone can do this type of thing locally. And so what we did was we put in a whole bunch of FOIs looking at all different areas. Um, and then we kept a Google sheet. Uh, Matthew Kelly, my colleague, um, ran this project and we kept a Google sheet. Everyone just put in there what they were asking for, the answers that they got. And when you're putting in an FOI, don't be vague. Keep it simple, focus and specific. No fishing expeditions or you will get nothing. Um, look at previous FOI applications that other people have done or your organisation has done. We reproduced some of those because we wanted to see whether access to information had changed or whether the, what we were seeking information, what, that those trends had changed. Um, so we got a lot of denials. Uh, we appealed, we appealed and we appealed again. Like I said, appeals to the Information and Privacy Commissioner are free. Uh, they take time, but they're worth it. Win, lose, we publish the stories. If we weren't allowed to have them, we publish them. So the individual stories, this has run over years, this series now. Um, the individual stories had power, but the real power was in the collective power of the, 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 the series and what we did, because what, what we found was we couldn't get any information hardly at all. And, the, and there were previous things like the ambulance wait times that we'd got a few years before, and then we were denied now. We asked why, they said the system has changed. Had, can they explain that? No, they wouldn't. So in essence, rather than reporting on our success stories, we collected denial after denial after denial, and it was a journalist's worst nightmare, to be honest, but we turned the traditional paradigm of a scoop upside down, and we highlighted our own newsroom failures. Um, and I think that the result was really, really powerful um, because when governments hide the truth or things that you know should be in the public domain that people have a right to know, it's very clear that they are covering up stuff. Um, and I think that this can be replicated um, by any journalist in any community around Australia. Um, and the last thing that I'll say before handing over to Andrew is that small newsrooms can make a big difference and one journalist can make a huge difference. And so basically it shown, what Shona was saying at the start, you know, get out there, crack some great yarns um, and here are my contact details. Um, 
Sorry if that was a bit rushed, guys. I wanted to try to pack in as much as I could. Um, and if anyone wants to get in contact, feel free. Um, like I said, I only work three days a week at the Newcastle Herald, but I will get back to you, I promise. Um, and thanks very much for listening. I really appreciate you all um, you know, signing up for this today. It's a common goal that we all need to you know, represent our communities, be the voice of our communities and hold power to account. And that's what investigative journalism is all about. Andrew, I'll sign over to you. Sorry, I'm also quite bad with technology. Um, thank you very much for that, Donna, um, and congratulations for winning um, the ACME, the very first gold ACME last week. Um, that was a great, um, a great initiative from the company, uh, New One. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Gomeroy um, land and acknowledge um, Elders past, present and emerging, um, very emerging. Um, and um, basically what I'm going to do today is just tell you about an, an investigation of a story I wrote um, last year. So this was a nine month long or thereabouts um, story, series of stories, and it was very iterative. So one story would lead to another, would lead to another, would lead to another. Um, essentially, I came across it sort of midway through the process, to be honest. Um, the, the guts of it is... Um, there is a mental health unit at the Tamworth Hospital, as there are um, at many hospitals. Um, it's a very old unit, it's built in 93, um, and it's not adequate, basically. It's uh, not adequate for two reasons, one of which is that it wasn't designed to be a mental health unit. And the second is the services provided in it don't um, cover the community to the degree it needs to. So at the moment, it has 25 beds in it, um, and all of those only service adults. So there are, no, there are no beds for kids, which is where the story actually ended up going. But there's also no beds for um, seniors either. Um, the community, by the time I um, came to this paper, the community had already done a long um, uh, petition before the 2019 election, which was successful in convincing the government to um, commit to funding a new unit, which is great. And in fact, the first time I even heard the name Banksy Mental Health Unit was at the press conference when they announced the new unit. Um, so job done you'd think um except um no so when they announced the, the new unit um it was a 33 bed unit which is is uh, eight additional um if you want to do the maths in your head um and um a couple of people were just talking to me about this and said hey you know it'd be interesting to look at the clinical services plan of this unit clinical services plan being the document that is used, it's a very technical document, but it has a narrative in it as well as like words in it as well as, as modeling and so on. Um, and people said, you know, it'd be interesting to look at the clinical services plan of this unit because we just like to know what's actually gonna be provided here. Are they, will, be, will there be intensive care beds for, for people? What, what, you know, will there be seniors beds? These details hadn't been worked out and government wasn't providing it. So I actually, um, this is probably quite unethical, but I ambushed um, the head of, the um, a local health district at a press conference once and just said, um, can I please have it? Can you give it to me? And he was like, yeah, no problem. Sure, absolutely, have it, great. And I went, yeah, cool, I'll email you. So I chucked an email to them and they said, oh no, 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 no. Um, so the media unit knew something, the CEO did not. Um, and I kept pushing and I kept pushing and I kept pushing. And eventually by lobbying for this, um, I was emailed something else that was very embarrassing, which was, that the new unit wasn't going to have a single um, kid's bed in it. Um, all eight additional beds were going to be adults um, for, 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 sen for seniors, I mean. So for people over the age of 65. Um, part of the reason why, and this was a specific element in the original petition, part of the reason why people really, really cared about children's beds at the Tamworth Hospital is because um, there are no services at all for children in Tamworth right now. So today, if you are a mentally ill um, child, 16 years old, and you attempt suicide, or you have a, a very serious um, weight um, problem, there's a thousand different reasons why, you, why this might happen. And you're assessed as being uh, requiring acute mental health service, uh, acute mental health care. What will happen? One of three things will happen. Uh, the, the first thing that will happen in every case will be you'll turn up at the emergency room at Tamworth Hospital and you'll be assessed. And then one of three things will happen. Either you will end up in, um, uh, you'll end up going home, even though you really shouldn't be, uh, often, even though you really shouldn't be. 
Um, or you might end up going to Banksia, the Banksia Mental Health Unit, which is an adults only unit. Um, so children do get, a, do get sent there, even though there are no specialist staff. The third thing that can happen is you can be put, and this is the worst one, is that you can be put in the back of an ambulance, strapped down in the back of an ambulance, potentially sedated and driven to Newcastle, which is about four and a half, five hours away by ambulance. Um, and a lot of these people are poor. Um, their parents can't uh, go. So one of the children I spoke to, their parent was unable to afford to drive to Newcastle. Um, anyway, so story... Um, so I um the the basic plan was I'd get these documents right and that was a quite a difficult process um, because of the difficulty of FOI and I eventually used I used a different process than FOI to get them um, so the, the the clinical services plan actually had an explanation for why this decision had been made um, not to provide the service. I'll just be at my minute, sorry. Moving on, right. So clinical services plan actually had, document, had, had an explanation for why this decision was made in it, which I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but the basic, what I sort of want to say today is, is I want to pick up on one of Donna's themes that she said, which is that people should be at the heart of every story. And I'm, I'm a huge idiot and didn't put people at the start of one of my first stories. So... I actually got these documents um, um, uh, through through a parliamentary process and had a read of them. They're about 600 pages long and they're very complicated and have lots of different elements in them. A lot of them were, um, at that time, were um, redacted. So you couldn't read. Specifically, the one table I really wanted to see was the modelling um, for service requirement versus service provision, um, which I eventually did get. Um, the reason I wanted to see the modelling um, was because, um, you know, if government models that there's, a, you know, that there's a demand for X and then provides X minus two, then that's a story, right? So that, that's what was in my head when I was getting these documents was there was going to be, it was going to be modelling and they were going to say, oh, you need two and a half, three beds. Um, there's that amount of demand in the community, which is what, that's true. That's what the modelling eventually said. But I hadn't got that yet. And I did an appeal and the appeal was successful and I eventually got it. But in the first instance, I did get an explanation as to why the decision was made. The, the explanation was um, the reason the government will not provide any child and adolescent beds in a community the size of Tamworth, which is um, just for people who haven't been here, 60,000 people in Tamworth, but the Tamworth Hospital care, caters to a community of 171,000 people. So it's not a small area at all. Um, and to have zero services, um, you know, literally zero beds at all is, um, I would have thought that 171,000 people would be above the threshold that you'd say, actually, come on. But um, the government disagreed. Anyway, um, the, the reason given in the internal documentation was a youth and adolescent mental health unit in a community the size of Tamworth might not reach, quote, economies of scale. So because it was going to cost more money to provide that service, it would be cheaper to provide that service in a big unit in Newcastle rather than in a medium-sized unit in Newcastle and a small unit in Tamworth. It would be cheaper. That's literally the only reason that was given. So I thought that was pretty devastating, right? I thought that's that's pretty spectacular bit of evidence there. Um, and I wrote a story on it and a bunch of people read it and a bunch of people called me to say they're outraged and a bunch of People in the community told me how terrible it was um, and then nothing happened. <laughs> so um, I, um, I was like, haha, okay. Um, and then I knew that there was going to be a second story because I knew that we were going to get um, an appeal and there was going to be additional information after that appeal, which is what happened. And I decided to write the second story with the person in the middle of it. So I went, um, I went out and found someone who'd actually been through that experience, uh, whose name is uh, Ray. And Ray, Ray's a 16 year old. Um, Ray Walsh is her name, sorry. I thought it was Ray Ware, I don't know why. Um, so Ray Walsh is 16, 16 year old and she, um, she did actually try to kill herself uh, last year, uh, beginning of last year, so about a year ago. Um, she 
did that exact process. So she ended up in the, in the emergency room. She was then put in the back of an ambulance and driven to Newcastle. And just describing what that's like was like just putting that at the top and the bottom of the story turned what was probably a worse story journalistically, right, had less interesting information in it than the fact that, than the reason, um, into a much more effective story in terms of its effect on the community, right? People, more people read it for starters, um, but also I think that, um, you know, I think that, that having a face, literally a photographed face of a person made the difference. So, um, yeah, uh, essentially that that is, that is the story in a nutshell. Um, I can sort of, if you want to ask some questions, I can sort of tell you how I got the different ingredients of that, but I thought I'd just explain what the story actually was. Um, but um, if I can give one piece of advice to people, don't do what I did. Don't just make it a mechanical institutional story. Um, yeah, how did I find out? Okay. Um, I just spoke to lots of people, basically. Um, I, um, I spoke to a lot of, um, a, lot, a lot of it was Facebook. So people would comment in the bottom of our stories and you can pick people up off there. That's a good one. And then from getting one person, you can get another person and another person and another person. Um, but I actually didn't get her that way. The way I got her was I just spent six months just telling people about the story I was writing. Um, everyone in the community. So I was literally going around in grocery stores and stuff um, and being like, hey, I'm writing a story about youth mental health care. Do you know anyone who's been to a, you know, to a youth mental health care unit? Um, for six months I was doing this. And eventually it worked. Somebody said, yeah, I do. It's one of my classmates. Um, this, is, this happened to her. And I called her up. And was like, you know, did this really happen? And she said yes. Um, the interesting thing about Ray, um, I did have to, I did have to talk to a lot of people um, involved in this story um, to get them to to talk about it. But Ray, um, Ray literally wanted to. I didn't have to talk her into it at all. I didn't have to argue. I literally, I'd spoken about ten words to her, and she said, "Yeah, let's go." Um, and I said, "Do you want to be in a photo?" And she said, "Yes." So she was the bravest person. However, her mum didn't. So her, the, the daughter was going to be named and the mum wasn't, which is really funny. But um, she eventually agreed to be um, named after I sort of talked to them a bunch of times and that we became clear what was going to, what was going to happen. Um, she she could, could, could clearly realise it was going to be look a bit silly on the page if it's like an anonymous mum um, and for that reason was willing to be identified. But other people weren't. Other people wanted to remain anonymous um, and I basically made a rule that I wouldn't identify any kids if they didn't want to um, and I wouldn't try to talk people into doing it unless they agreed to or even try to convince them to. Um, yeah, um, absolutely, I did. Um, I just did a lot of time. Um, Anna actually works in our paper, so <laughs> she knows um, the time pressure as well. Um, I just did a lot of work on my own time, to be honest. That's how I found the time. Are there any more questions down there? I bet there are. Ooh. How did I convince people? How did I find her? Uh... Yeah, yep, I did. Yeah, there's another bit of advice I can give you, which is, yeah, totally, totally. I think I think that's, I think, how did I verify everything she had to say? Um, so the um, the health department did. I also got some documents from her, like health documents and stuff that I could use to verify. Um, but the government documents. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Ah, I don't. Technologically terrible. So how did I verify everything the young girl had to say for docs were under apps? So um, some, so the clinical services plan, which is plenty of documents, they were secret, but her, her medical stuff was, obviously it's confidential, but she provided it to me so I could read it. So I could see what had happened. But um, yeah, there's a lot of stories out there. 
this is another bit of advice I have. There's a lot of stories out there in rural areas. This is the big event benefit we have um, that are just basically like the everyday, um, what is expected of people, the indignities that are that people are subjected to just because um, we have a centralised health system um, and we have an underfunded health system. Yeah, so, okay, you want me to talk about that bit. Um, so if you work in New South Wales, New South Wales has a wonderful, wonderful um, rule called Standing Order 52. Have you, do, do you know about this, Donna? Yeah, it's great. Um, uh, it's basically FOI on steroids. Um, it, it, it has the power of parliament. So Standing Order 52 is basically parliament can pass a motion requiring the government to provide a document, any document. Um, of any of any type um, the government is allowed to say no um, or to redact elements of it but if they do it can be appealed and the appeal goes to a parliamentary officer who's a bipartisan individual who doesn't work for the government so that person does not care if the government is going to be embarrassed by documents that person does not care if um, you know some minister is going to have a bad day they don't mind they they do protect identities they do protect commercial and confidence stuff you can't get that sort of stuff um, but, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, um, the government did try to redact stuff and then it was unredacted by this person. So it's a, it's a good process. Um, the benefit of it is that, it, um, that it's quite rapid. So it, it, can, it, it moves very fast. It moves faster than FOI, I think. And um, because it has the power of um, like, a, like an order of parliament, right, that, that um, ignoring it or not doing it or in any way defying it is illegal. So it's, um, it's a powerful tool and I, I used it to the, to the hilt. Yeah, so um, the question is, how did the government react to the story? Did it affect change? I have great news. Um, they're building the unit. <laughs> um, so the documents, the, they're, their modelling said three beds, they're building four beds, and they're also adding a, a specialist unit next to the beds that will leave, um, yeah, that, that, will, that will act um, in other communities. So, you know, it's, it's oh dear, my battery's running low. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's important not just to have adequate acute, and this is acute mental health, right? This is not just, um, this is people who are at the absolute end of their tether, um, what happens after you end leave an acute unit is you go home, right, eventually, and you'll often get services through a local um, primary care um, service or potentially a not-for-profit service, either either, um, sometimes one, sometimes the other. Headspace is a good example of this, um, federally funded, um, but there are some public options as well. Um, and what the government's doing in addition to building the acute unit that is actually needed is they're going to provide a, an outreach unit um, that travels from Tamworth Hospital and provides the extra service, the extra level of service you can get in an acute unit, but in small communities where there isn't actually a hospital for, to be able to do that, right? So it not only does it mean we're going to have really good youth mental health care in Tamworth, it also means we're going to have really good youth mental health care in Gunnedah and Armidale and Narrabri. It's like, um, it's a new model. The government has just started doing this. Um, there's 15 units um, going to be implanted in various places around New South Wales. I'm sure there's one in Newcastle um, and there's one in Tamworth too. So that is a huge big deal. That's probably even a bigger deal than, than the adolescent kids' beds. So I think that's a pretty big deal too. Um, what was the other question? How do I feel knowing I help facilitate access to a profound outcome? Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, um, it's a lot of money. I, I, heard, I heard an actual costing for the amount of money it costs the state government. Um, it's $15 million, which is a lot of money. Um, and I'm just sort of overwhelmed by that <laughs> sheer cash. But, um, yeah, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people out there who will now get um, a service that is absolutely needed um, that they wouldn't have got otherwise. And it's something everyone can do. You know, any, any journalist can do that. If you find an injustice, it is possible to embarrass people. They're still, despite the era of Donald Trump, people can still be shamed into stuff. Uh, when did I first know, know I wanted to be an investigative journalist? I, I'm going to make Donna answer this because I don't, 
I don't have an interesting answer. I think Donna does. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. Um, look, I um, I used to watch 60 Minutes with my pop from when I was nine years old and I and never wanted to be anything else, to be honest. Um, so I'm probably a bit unusual. Um, yeah, I, all through school, I did work experience in, as a journalist when I was in year 10. Um, just had a really, um, I, I think the thing that I love about it, and it's not quite what you asked, but the thing that I love about it <laughs> is um, writing wrongs. And, and that's what we as journalists in, and, you know, like can do. Um, and it doesn't matter where you work, um, you can hold power to account and you can write wrongs. And, and the one thing that I always say to people and that m most people don't come to a journalist as their first point of call. Um, uh, you know, genuine people, they've tried all of the other avenues, they've done everything that they can. Um, they don't end up with a journalist as their first point of call. It's generally their last they are desperate and they need help. And as a human being, if I can help someone when they're in that situation, then that, that's all I need. I'm, I'm happy and I go home with a smile on my face every day. So um, just like Andrew, you know, managing to get the government to change their direction to provide services for your community. Um, you, 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 I mean, you know, obviously you want to win the war fleet and I wish you all the best, but you've already got your reward. You got yeah, your reward. Yeah. <laughs> Look, yeah, it'll be good. I mean, it'll be good when they've built it, right? Um, yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen something you built, but it'll be really good. When <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, that, and I think that, you know, that's, you know, that's the power um that, that that you know like that all journalists you know we can all we can all do this kind of work you just um you know it, I, I think the biggest issue is making time for it and, and yeah. if you have that mindset and like Andrew make sure the stories are relatable be relentless be dogged and I have to say that definitely um I, I, I have done a lot of work in my own time and I, I listen to podcasts with investigative journalists and they all say it I mean you know um and I know the union probably wouldn't like me saying that yeah um yeah, so um, time off in lieu, time off in lieu, negotiate it with your boss. Um, Donna, did you find it hard to get started in investigations as an early career journalist or was it something you launched into? Ah, oh, okay, so I was a crime reporter to start with, a, a, a police reporter, um, and um, I did that for quite a fair while and then I moved, uh, I did a range, of, a range of different rounds, but crime was, was, was my thing. Um, and then I moved into Chief of Staffing and then after that, um, moved into like day editing and then um, went went into investigative type stuff like long like you know like things that take a little bit more than you know you know turning them over in a day but I still like I said I still do general news um, because we've all got a pitch in there okay um, so if there's no more questions um, I thank everyone for, for, for being here um, and I, I want to say as, as the people in the um, the comments did I really appreciate Andrew's emotion about his oh. about his stories I get so involved in my stories as well because the thing is it's about people and you know and, and if you're helping someone or if you're helping your community to me that 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 is really what matters um, public interest interest journalism is where it's at um, and, you know, us in regional and rural communities, we need to be the voice for our community and stand up for our community when, when you know, when, when they're not, when they're being given a raw deal. Um, and, and that's our jobs. And, you know, I, I encourage you all, um, you know, to, to, to do that because um, there's nothing better. Um, and that, that's my honest belief. And you can tell from Andrew's emotion um, that he feels the same way. And thanks a million for the Walkleys for putting this on. I hope you all got something out of it. Feel free to get in contact anytime. Thanks very much. Thanks.